Are we on the verge of being able to design and engineer new forms of life and consciousness? In this conversation, I welcome Professor Michael Levin back on the podcast to discuss the long-term implications of his research into bioelectricity. The discussion ranges from cures to cancer and regrowing limbs to the potential risks of designing and building artificial superintelligences and the ethics of engineered organisms. I'm Shane Farnsworth, and this is the Escape Sapiens podcast. These conversations are supported by the Andrea von Braun Foundation. If you enjoy what I'm doing, please consider subscribing, liking, and sharing this content. And now, here's Michael Levin. I hope you enjoy. Escape Sapiens. Michael Levin, welcome back on the podcast. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me back. So today, I realize you've given a, a million uh, interviews recently. You, you've somehow really touched a cultural nerve. And so I want to give you the chance to do something a little bit different to the other interviews that you've uh, been on. Uh, and so the goal today is not to focus necessarily directly on your research, but more the downstream implications. And so this, in particular, I, I want to ask you about, on, on the one <clears> hand, <throat> medical applications. So a potential cancer um, cures and maybe regrowing limbs uh, so along these lines. And then on the social side, I want to ask what your research means. You know, what, what does it tell us about uh, where we are in the universe and where we fit into the tree of life? Okay. So those are the sort of the two uh, main goals uh, today. And I thought I'd start off with a question that I think you'll have something interesting to say on and which I've sort of been curious about for a while. And that is... Um, so Hugh Hefner, he had his youngest child, his last child, when he was something like 65 years old. Okay. And as far as I know, his child was completely healthy and there was nothing wrong, perfectly normal uh, boy. And so what I want to understand is, the question is, if aging has to do with genetic deterioration, you know, if DNA damage, if that's the case, then how is it that old people can have young children? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll give you some thoughts, uh, having prefaced this by saying that I'm not actually an aging expert. I, you know, my lab doesn't really work on aging. So, so I'll, you know, having said that, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I think. I mean, <clears throat> um, w one of the things to keep in mind is that to, to uh, the de development is um, is really robust to a lot of things. And certainly it's the case that there there can be significant mutations that completely screw up the process. But there can be many other changes, both epigenetically and genetically, that don't really do much of anything. And I think that uh, apparently what what this is telling us is that it's possible to maintain, uh, germ cells, in particular male germ cells, long periods of time without accumulating enough damage that they would not be fixable during embryogenesis. That that apparently is what, what we're seeing. I mean, uh, the whole the whole issue of, of of aging and how you produce young cells. I mean, you, you know, planaria are a great example of that, right? Because you've got these flatworms that, as far as we can tell, forever produce healthy, normal planarian cells. There's no sign of aging that I know of. Um, so, so we know in theory it's possible, and so I think uh, I think that's what we're seeing here in this in this case. On the topic of planaria, so these are these flatworms where you, when you cut them, they they separate and they grow new heads and completely new organs, and they're immortal. Is is there is there a link between immortal? So, what what is the more precise link between immortality and regeneration? Are they separate, or or can you really say that they're linked in this this, this sort of a way? Yeah, um, it's 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 not really known. I mean, there are there are some very regenerative organisms that do have a lifespan limit. So, for example, um, axolotls. So, axolotls are highly regenerative, but they they do have a lifespan limit. I mean, in theory, regen in order in order to regenerate properly, you need two things. You need uh, the information of what is it that we're that the cells are going to build, and then you need healthy cells to 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 be able to do it. So I, I don't know, uh, you know, the, the thing with planaria if for, for sure is that they are absolute masters at maintaining the information needed to specify a new worm from a pile of cells. So that, that part they've got down and we could talk about um, some, some ideas for, for why that is. Uh, but then they also have the ability to produce these new healthy cells in perpetuity. I mean, this is, like I said, there's no real sign of aging. So um, they, you know, they seem to have both. And I think 
in principle, if we were to solve the, the, if we were to really solve the regeneration problem, I think we would have many of the answers to degenerative disease, aging, and so on. But there are, you know, uh, there are these two kind of issues to think about is, is, is where do the new cells come from? And then how does the cellular collective know what these cells should be building? Hmm. With the planaria, does, does, do they also have sort of the regular telomeres that we other organisms have that get shorter or, or do they not I, have that process? Yeah, I, I don't actually know. Um, uh, I, I don't think terribly much has been done about that, but I do, I do think that the, I've, I've seen a couple papers on, uh, on, hmm. on planaria and telomeres. I'm not, I'm not up on, you know, on the latest there, um, but I think, I think some, some information exists, but we obviously need a lot more. You, you would think that if it were that simple, there would be a lot of organisms making use of that, right? That, that seems like a, like a fairly simple fix. So uh, I, I have to think that, uh, I think there's more to it than, than that, than simply preventing the shortening, but, uh, but I'm not sure it's known. Is it the case, so, so for example, if, if you were to clone a human from say a skin cell, um, presumably the telomeres in the DNA in that cell have, you know, if you t take a cell from an adult human, Presumably they're shorter. And so the question would be, you know, do you also expect to see a shorter life expectancy for the child, uh, the clone in this case? Or is that known whether uh, clones have a reduced lifespan uh, as a result of that sort of a process? I mean, I think the traditional way of cloning where you pass it through uh, an, an egg cell, right? You pass the, the the nucleus of the somatic cell through an egg cell. My, my memory is, and again, I'm not an expert in this, but my memory is that that, that resets uh, the clock. Uh, whether that would be true using the uh, kind of the newer techniques, let's say uh, the Yamanaga factors or things like this. I have no idea. That might be that might be a good question for somebody like David Sinclair. I don't know. Hmm. But so do you, do you have, um, you know, you mentioned last time we spoke that there were uh, possible um, therapies for longevity that might come out of your research. Do you have any, is it, do you have any ideas in this direction that you're able to share at this point or is it too, too early? Yeah, I mean, the, the general, I can, I can give you the general, the general idea. The general idea is that one of the things you see uh, during, during aging is uh, kind of a degradation of morphogenetic information that is, uh, cells are just not as good anymore at repairing wounds, at, uh, you, you know, the, the, the information that is necessary to, for, for a cellular collective to know what it's supposed to be building tends to degrade. Um, some of that is likely due to a degradation of the material, so, so genetic errors and things like that. And some of it may be informational degradation. And so I suspect that once we figure out uh, regeneration, in other words, we're, we are able to communicate with these cellular collectives and uh, program them for specific anatomical outcomes by, uh, by, by reinforcing that information. I think we're going to be able to uh, overcome a, a large chunk of what happens during aging, whether that will be the whole story or whether something else will be needed, some more conventional thing will be needed, like the, um, the telomere, uh, the telomere mm -hmm. business. I, I don't know. It, most likely it'll be a combination of the two approaches. So do you, do you suspect, okay, so there's a combination of the two approaches, but do you suspect, you know, if you were to look at the difference between a young organism and an old organism, is that, is the difference primarily at the cell level, do you think, or do you think there is a large component that's really at the, the level of organs and, and the creature itself? I, I, sus I strongly suspect that there is a larger component, but I can't prove that. And we haven't really done work on this yet. So, so I don't know, but I'm certainly hoping to, to get into that in the future and start to start looking at that. For example, one of the things that hasn't been done is to look at uh, the bioelectric properties of tissues during aging. So we know what happens in, in some model species during, regen during development as you go from a, from a single egg to, a, to an organism, there's a, there's a lot of changes in the bioelectrical pre-pattern. And then they sort of settle down during, ma during maturity. What happens after that, we don't know. So we actually know nobody's actually done. I mean, nobody's done a lot of this uh, physiomic profiling and never mind uh, kind of the bioelectric profiling and aging. But this, this, this has to be done. And it's something that, that we're going to do in the future. And then I'm sure others will do too. Mm -hmm. So is there, a, for, is there a possibility that you could, for example, read out the bioelectric pattern of your body at a young age and somehow use some sort of uh, therapeuticals to you know, overwrite at a later date and reset. Is that the idea or? I suspect so. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I suspect so. I suspect that uh, reinforcing the correct bioelectrical pattern 
uh, is is something that's going to be an important part of uh, of, of of a kind of uh, aging um, uh, a, a, you know the strategy that addresses aging. Yeah, I think I think that'll be an important part of it. But again, this is just these are very early days. The real work just hasn't been done on this yet. Hmm. On, so on other sort of medical directions that I'm interested in. So one of the, one of the most interesting outcomes of your work, or at least what I find most interesting, is that you were able to regrow uh, legs of frogs. Um, and that you're working now on bioreactors for mice. Um, and so I'm, I'm sort of curious how far you can push this. So aside from just regrowing limbs or maybe organs, is there any possibility uh, in an adult, in, in, a, in a grown animal that you could, for example, um, uh, here's an example. So, so someone who's transgender, if they wanted to do a sex change, is, is there a, a chance that uh, someone like this could go through a non-surgical operation uh, to change their sex? Or, um, you know, c c could you even go beyond sort of um, and look, look for non-human augmentations? So, for example, antlers or, or tails or gills or something along these lines? Yeah, I mean, I... I believe that down the line, and, and, and so someday when we really have cracked the morphogenetic code, when we're actually able to specify what structures cellular collectives need to build, I think at that point, you're going to be able to have whatever you want. If you wanted antlers or a tail or whatever it is, I, that, you know, uh, that, that'll be, someday that'll be possible. Now, in the short term, what I think will be possible before that is to, is to trigger the Re, um, the repair and the growth of, of standard body organs that uh, that that are easy to to respecify with with uh, sort of so, sort of default or wild type patterns that that's that's going to come first and uh, what's not known yet is whether injury is an injury context is an important part of that so whether whether if you wanted a new structure whether you would have to first create some sort of injury and then once those cells are in a mm -hmm. receptive state uh give them that information or whether you could do it uh straight up in the in the, in the normal in a normal state is unclear we, we we've done some example mm -hmm. uh, some some experiments on this um one example was uh a, 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 long, a while back when we were studying um, implanting eyes on the tails of tadpoles, and this is uh, Doug Blackiston's work in my group, who showed that if you put tails on the eyes of tadpoles, they can see quite well out of those eyes. I mean, it's an amazing sort of thing. But one of the things that we worked on was improving that vision by uh, increasing the amount of optic nerve that comes out of those eyes. And so we found a drug that was able to do that. And we soaked the whole animal in this drug. And this, this, this single optic nerve that normally comes out of that eye, just there's like an explosion of, of, ner of nerve. It just goes everywhere. And so then, then we looked at the normal native nerves in the head because we were worried that, wow, we're just causing massive um, overgrowth of all the neurons. And we found no differences whatsoever. The only neurons that responded to this were the ones that were in the wrong location. They were the ones coming out of this ectopic eye. And so one possibility is that in an area with no damage, no injury, when the cells are perfectly happy as far as where they are and all their, all their needs are met and all their, um, uh, their, their local uh, error estimates are low and, and everything's cool, they may completely ignore these signals. And so only, only cells that are in the wrong place or they've been injured or so, so some in some other way stressed that they start obeying these kinds of patterning signals in, in adulthood anyway. So, so it may be that uh, mm -hmm. the first step towards some kind of body modification or body augmentation is going to be the creation of, a, of, a, of an injury state or at least faking it. I'm sure, I'm sure there will be some way of stressing those local cells uh, in, the, in a way that in a, in a you know, less invasive way that causes them to perk up and pay attention and maybe become more plastic and, and take up new information about what they should be doing. I guess if, if you did have to injure, make an injury prior to you know, growing whatever organ it was that you wanted to grow, I mean, a, a key thing that you'd have to do is prevent scarring over to start with. And so there's a question that I'm quite curious about, which is, um, you know, human <laughs> livers are really regenerative. Has have people look in, looked into? So if you if you if you had an injury and you you take liver cells and you you place them over the injury, do you know if that promotes growth and prevents scarring? Have people looked at this sort of a thing? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I'm 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 not aware of it. Um, maybe I I've not seen anything like that. We we had a little bit of a a, a pilot project a while back trying to. Uh, in, in um, implant uh, uh, actual brain tissue. Now, this was in a tadpole model, trying to implant brain tissue next to wounds on the theory that uh, it may it may make it easier. We had some we had some encouraging early preliminary data. We haven't we haven't published anything yet, 
but um, that 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 type of approach might uh, might well be may, it'd be interesting down the line. We'll be able to uh, to mimic it with with either smart implants of some sort or a biodome or a, some kind of opt- optogenetic stimulation or something like that. But yeah, maybe. One of the things that I'm quite curious about is on the theory side, what it was that told you to use this or that chemical. So, for example, you know, I think from memory um, from last time we spoke. Uh, you said that when um, when you're looking at regenerating frog legs, I think it was progesterone that you used to start with, or something along those lines. And so, I, what I'm curious about is, you know, what was the idea? What was the, that kernel, that key thing that you had that people before you didn't have that pointed out that you should be doing, or that maybe this is something that might work? You know, what what was that um, key idea that was missing uh, before? Yeah, the, the, the progesterone is a little bit of a, a, a of a red herring here in the sense that uh, it's 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 something that we try for other reasons. It's not specifically bioelectric, and and it's not something that came out of our predictive platform. the the way The way that we do this and the way that we choose these drugs is that we have a simulator, and this is a this is a piece of software written by um, Allen Center member Alexis Pytak. She made this amazing uh, simulator in which in which you can you can set up a bunch of virtual cells, and you can say these cells have these different ion channels. And then uh, what it does is it, it, it simulates the physics to tell you what the future bioelectric states are going to be. So if you have a simulator like this, you can, you can sort of work it backwards and ask, okay, that's what the states are going to be, but, but those are disease states. I would like to change that to a, to a different state. And now the question is, which channels would I need to open and close to change the state in the way that I like? So, so once you do that, once you know which channels you want to open and close, and, and it's not obvious, you can't do it by just you know, sort of looking at it because everything is, com- is highly nonlinear, right? These, cha- these channels, every time they open and close, they change the voltage, which changes the way the other channels work. I mean, it's a mess. So you have to do the simulation. Um, once you know which channels to target, then you can simply go to the shelves and say, okay, well, here's, here's a, a, an HCN2 channel. What do I have that's an opener of that channel? And there are some drugs. And, and in fact, one of the cool things about it is that something like 20% of all human, uh, you, in all drugs in human use are ion channel drugs. So there's this massive library already of human approved electroceuticals potentially that you can use for these various indications. What you need is the computational platform. And that's something we're working on very hard now is to improve that and to uh, incorporate a bunch of machine learning uh, kinds of tools so that you can actually say, okay, this is this is the pattern that, that's there now and it's incorrect. Here's the correct pattern I would like. Now, which channels do I open and close to make that happen? And then from there, it's pretty easy to pick to pick drugs. So, so in the past, that's what that's what we were doing. And so so just to give you a simple example, and this I think is, uh, this is uh, Vipav uh, Pai's work in our group. Um, this is some, I, I think one of our most successful applications. It was just, just amazing when I saw this. Basically, uh, we had embryos that uh, you could treat them with alcohol or nicotine, or you could mutate certain genes like Notch, which is an important neurogenesis gene. So you do all these things, and any of them cause really severe brain defects. And we looked at the bioelectric pattern and the bioelectric pattern was just, was just completely wiped out. There's a normal, there's a normal pre-pattern that tells uh, the early brain, how big it should be, where it should be, where the edges of it should be and stuff like that. And this was, this was totally screwed up by these teratogens. And so, and so Pi and Alexis uh, made this model, this computational model. And we said, okay, here's, here's the wrong pattern. What would we have to do to it to, uh, to make it right again? And the, the, the software came up with a really clever, um, uh, 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 strategy, which is that there's one particular channel called HCN2, which just acts like a contrast enhancer. It's basically like uh, like a, like a sharpen filter on your Photoshop. It just it just any voltage that's low stays low, but any voltage that's a little bit high, it sh- it shoots it up higher. So basically, any compartment boundary, be, let's say between the brain and the part that's not supposed to be brain, if it's kind of too similar, it'll it'll magnify that difference, and it just sharpens all the gradients. And so, so, okay, so HCN2 channel. And so the first thing we did was to uh, just inject a bunch of wild type HCN2 channels. And I'll never forget this. Uh, uh, this so, so Pi did all this work and then, and then uh, he was away for a while and, and I was the one who scored, I had to score the embryos to see what the outcome was. And I took him out of the incubator and I'm looking at these, at these incubator and at these uh, channels and uh, the, these embryos injected with the channel. And of course there has to be a control. The control is 
you have to uh, you have to inject the channel with no with no teratogen, mm -hmm. right? Just to make sure that, that that alone doesn't screw something up. So so of course we had that control. And so I'm looking at these look at these embryos. There's no defects, but there's something funny about them. And I'm and I'm staring. I'm sitting there staring at this dish, trying to figure out what 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 what, what there's something something's wrong. And I'm very used to looking at defects. I mean, this is you know I've looked at millions and millions of embryos by now, so I so I can I can recognize when something's wrong. And and then I and then I realize what it is. These embryos are too too perfect. They're like, um, normally when you look at a collection of embryos, uh, you know, it, it, there's, there's one or 2% defects all the time, just from, from developmental noise. So, so it'll be a little, some of them will be a little wonky. Some of them will, their face will be a little too narrow. Some of these a little longer, a little short. There's, there's a range of, 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 of malformations, just, just, you know, just normally. And they're, they're all, they're all slightly different. These guys look like they came off an assembly line. Like, they look like plastic toys. Like if you went and bought a bag of, you know, plastic tadpoles that were all like stamped out of a, you know, out of a machine, that's what they look like. They were all perfect. They were all identical. It was, there was just no sign of anything wrong. And I said, that is, yeah, that, that's, I, 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 that's amazing. And then I, and then I went and of course scored the dishes that had been uh, treated with teratogen. And then I saw that they were far improved. And uh, so not only does this strategy improve the ones that got nailed with a, with a teratogen, but they also help normal embryos overcome the physiological noise of development. They're like, it's like a tune up. It's like a sharpening of all the, you know, just, 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 just sharpens all the, all the uh, borders between all the, all the, um, all the organs. And so, and so it's really important. I, I like that. And, and then, and then, so, so that was that. And then, and then subsequently there was a series of papers. One just came out last week where we basically used existing um, uh, drugs that open HCN2. And this is, so for example, gabapentin, lamotrigine, these are things that people already take, they're anti-epileptics and so on. And so people already take these drugs. And so, so we use those drugs to show that you can fix brain defects, you can fix heart defects, you can fix uh, gut defects, uh, uh, eye and craniofacial defects. It's all the same, just by sharpening these, uh, these mm -hmm. gradients. And, and so I think this is really important because 20 years ago, when I started doing this work in bioelectrics, we, we were doing screens, which means that you test the various ion channels and you see what happens. That's how you start, right? Just by sort of poking at the, at the, at the edges of the space to see what's possible. But now we're to the point where we're not just screen, we're not screening anymore. We have a, we have a predictive computational platform that actually tells you which drugs to use. I mean, this, this, this computer platform actually told it, told us HCN2 is what you want. And then, and then you, you, you know, you can, even from that, you immediately go to these drugs. And so, and I have to do a disclaimer here because, because I have a commercial interest in all of this. This is um, Dave Kaplan and I, have a company called Morphaceuticals Inc. that we that we founded that's uh, based on using these kind of strategies to regenerate limbs to repair birth defects and so on. So I need you know I need to I need to put that out there. But um, uh, but but that's the, but that's the strategy. That's where these drugs come from. They come from the computational platform. When you say the embryos look like they came off a production line, I wonder what impact that would have. Say you're doing this with human embryos. I wonder what impact that would have on personality, you know, would, would you end up with, um, uh, humans that were more similar if you took, if you, you put them all through the same process, um, do, do you have any idea where that it's, it's going? hard to say. I mean, I, anything I say here, it would be pure speculation, but, but my, yeah, well, uh, but, but my, my guess is that, uh, it wouldn't matter all that much. Because, because even once you've reduced all the quote unquote defects, and that's a whole other thing is what exactly is a defect, uh, you are still left with a brain that's exquisitely tuned to um, modify itself based on experience. And just the fact that no two humans can ever have exactly the same environment growing up simply by even by virtue of just having different physically different perspectives on the world because they can't be located in the same space at the same time. Uh, I think those those differences would add up, and I think you would have you would have you'd, you'd have a lot of variability still. I think, yeah, I, yeah, that, that's my guess. But but we actually we actually don't know. It's a good question. I'm curious about um, things like fetal alcohol syndrome. You know, I, I wonder if you could uh, take a child who was exposed in the womb to. You said you use nicotine and alcohol. Um, as inhibitors uh, in, in these tests. I wonder if, you know, after, after birth, you could, you know, go back in and somehow help children who have been exposed uh, in the womb to, you know, various toxins. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I don't know what is the latest. Uh, I, I think at that point, you're really getting into regenerative therapy and especially for the brain, you know, we've not yet gotten to the point where we can get a mature brain to regenerate itself. So I, I'm not sure. I think at this point, I think that's, that's farther off. 
Um, but but preventing those defects, I think, is 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 within reach. And so so we're doing experiments in mice now and trying to make sure that this works in mammals and so on. It, it, prevention does that mean the mother would have to take a drug, or you'd actually have to go in and inject the embryo itself with some? Yeah, I don't think no, I don't think you would have to inject the embryo. I think the mother would take the drug. Okay. And that wouldn't have any effect on her because she's already grown and this specifically uh, targets the channels that are active in the embryo. That's that, that would be the idea, but there's a lot of work to do, of course. So you have to get the dosage, right. You have to get the timing, right. I mean, there's a lot of work to do here, but again, to, to be clear, these are drugs that humans already take. So there's already people mm -hmm. taking lamotrigine and, and the gabapentin for, for various disorders. So there's already, mm -hmm. there's already a thing. You have a paper from last year in May sometime looking at, um, uh, it was some cancer research where you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong because I, I didn't, I just sort of skimmed through it. But um, the idea was that you could take uh, an animal and without exposing it to any carcinogens and without doing any DNA damage, you could um, disrupt the communication between the cells and generate cancers in the animal. And conversely, if, you, if there was an animal that already had a tumor, you could sort of re maybe reestablish the communication between uh, cells and sort of normalize the tumor. Is am I understanding that correctly? That's pretty wild. If that's uh, what you're able yeah, to do, is, is yeah, yeah. This is no, this is true. This is a series of papers that started in 2008. Our first paper on this was in 2008, and the last one uh, was just a few years ago. There's there's a whole series of them, and yeah, it's absolutely true. We found out that. You can kickstart, for example, uh, metastatic melanoma in a perfectly normal tadpole that's never been exposed to any kind of DNA damage or carcinogens or oncogenes or anything like that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And um, and then we show that uh, you can you can predict all this with a with a computation with a machine learning model, so we can we understand why 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 that happens. And then better better yet, we found out that when you uh, when you inject these uh, tadpoles with a human oncogene, so nasty things like KRAS mutations and things like that that normally cause tumors, you can, you can, you can uh, rescue that tumor by managing the bioelectrics appropriately. So even though the oncoprotein is very strongly expressed, and you can see it, um, you can see the oncoprotein levels, uh, there doesn't have to be a tumor if you manage the bioelectrics. So that, that, tells you, that tells you a few interesting things. It tells you much like, much like with, the, uh, with the brain repair, it tells you that some hardware errors are fixable in software, not all of them, but, but some of them, like, like the notch mutation, like the KRAS mutation, I mean, these are, these are pretty serious. Like I said, it's not all of them. You know, if you're missing some enzyme, bioelectrics isn't going to help you. But, uh, but, but for a lot of these things that look, that, that, that should be an extremely um, a powerful genetic defect, they're fixable in software. Because by providing the right bioelectrical signaling, you can basically override the, the deficiency on the, at the biochemical level. So yeah, so 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 our, our latest paper, we are now trying this in human glioblastoma cells. So this mm -hmm. is in vitro, and, and we just had a um, uh, Juanita Matthews is a staff scientist in our group. Just uh, a couple of weeks ago, had a nice paper out showing using um, drugs that uh, that humans already take, including some, uh, for example, some acid reflux drugs and things like that. That that uh, in the right combinations, they uh, they get uh, glioblastoma, human glioblastoma cells to stop proliferating, to partially differentiate, to to really change their phenotype. Yeah. So and 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 just in general, it it um, kind of uh, hammers away at this distinction between the genetic information and the physiological information. Right. That you you don't get everything you need to know from just reading the genetics. You know, because if you if you if you sequence that tadpole, you would see the KRAS mutation. You would say, "Oh yeah, this thing's definitely going to have a tumor." You'd be wrong. And same thing for the brain defect, and same thing for the two-headed flatworms. This is the, these are all examples where the reality and the genetic uh, information um, diverge strongly. Mm -hmm. What percentage of cancers do you think might be treatable through this process? Is it all, uh, or is it only ones that are? To have genetic damage or are there cancers in general, which are at the software level? Um, there, there, there are, and there are, there are lots of people. This is a very interesting and controversial area because uh, if the standard story about what causes cancer is a set of mutations, right? That's the standard story is an accumulated, accumulated set of clonal mutations. Um, that story has been under attack for, for many decades. And, and I don't think in the end it's, it's true. But, uh, and, and so there are certainly stressors in the environment that can, that can cause cancer that are not primarily uh, starting with a mutation. The mutations come later after the cells are, are, are stressed. 
Uh, but um, what percentage, you know, and, and, and in particular, what percentage are fixable in, with, with, in, the, in the software? I, I don't know. That's, I, couldn't, I couldn't give you a good answer because we haven't done large numbers. We've only done a few. So we've looked at, I don't know, four or five different types of oncogenes that cause different types of cancer, and they are all fixable. We, we haven't come across one that isn't, but that doesn't, I'm in no way claiming that every type of cancer is going to be solvable this way. I, we just don't know yet. How, how have these ideas sort of been received by people researching cancer? Is people sort of receptive to this sort of new way of looking at things or, or people sort of fixed in their own sort of bunkers and unable to, uh, how have you found that sort of interaction with researchers? Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't have a statistically valid sample. I don't take polls. I don't speak to, you know, thousands of researchers. I think that uh, as a whole, the community is, is kind of split is it's split along some lines so so there are a lot of people that are in that that have very uh heavy um incentives to stick with the current paradigm so there's a lot of there's a lot of money there's a lot of intellectual capital there's a lot of uh careers and funding uh histories and so on that are really invested in this idea that we are going to find some genes and uh we're going to target those genes and then and then you know everything will be solved uh, there is a, a growing collection of people, including many clinicians, who are just unsatisfied with where decades of that approach has gotten us clinically, and that uh, that f- that that really think that um, there needs to be a different approach. But I, I, f- I found that I found that it's really difficult to shake uh, kind of molecular cell biologists out of these ideas. But uh, people who are either clinicians or they work in physiology they are much more, they're much more receptive to it. So I think all of this, all of this is going to, uh, the, the answer as always is in the practical applications. As soon as there is a good treatment that's based on these things, that's when the tide is really going to turn. And, and, and that's fair enough. Mm. And, and how far away, I, I know you said this has been going on since 2008, but have you, have you done clinical trials in human? Uh, is it just in mice or what stage are you in development? Yeah, we've, um, so, so, so from 2008 to 21 it has all been frog work. So this has all been mm-hmm. doing very basic science in, in frogs. I mean, I, I've, I've done some things in collaboration with Madeline Udan and some other people in mammalian cells, but, and, um, uh, but, but, but all of that was focused on frog. Our first, our first humans in vitro work was just published um, this, this, this year, a couple of, couple of weeks ago. And so uh, for now, basically, I, the clock starts now in terms of trying to uh, put this out into some sort of clinical application. So we are, yeah, we're, we're, we're talking to people about setting up um, uh, in vivo trials in mice and then, uh, and then clinical trials in humans. That's that's you know, that's coming up. Um, yeah, is I mean, I'm not a clinician. That this is not uh, this is not my bread and butter. And so um, you know, uh, I'm working with people like Ken Pienta and others to uh, who, who really know how to how to do the, the clinical work. But this would be absolutely amazing. I mean, if if you could have a cure for even a small subset of cancers, this just changed lives of so many people. So I'm really hoping it does go uh, well. Thank well. you. I, 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 yeah, I do. I do too. This is uh, you know, I'm I'm. I'm, I'm sort of um, uh, schizophrenic on these things because, uh, you know, Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays, I, I wake up and I, and I think I'm a basic scientist and I kind of do very basic fundamental questions about life and cognition and things like that. And then on alternate days, I, all I think about is how do we get this into patients so that humans actually benefit? And it's uh, it, it's it's not always it, it's, it's hard to, um, you know, these are these are often uh, these paths require different uh, different uh, uh, prioritizations, you know. But yeah, I'm, I'm very motivated to, to try and improve uh, people's health this way. It's sort of, uh, as a researcher, it's almost the, um, the perfect sort of direction to be doing research in because you have the, the interest of the fundamental side where you can ask deep questions about, you know, what are, you know, what is an animal, what is life? But then on the other side, you can really have genuine impact. I, I'm, I'm sort of jealous about uh, how, how well your research spans these sort of two uh, different directions that really should be together. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm trying. I, I should say it's it's quite difficult because 
for example, just look at it from the funders perspective, you know, there are there are a few, uh, the, the, the vast majority of the funders out there in the ecosystem don't want to hear anything about what life is, what what selves are, what animals are, you know, what the basic of the basis of evolution is, they don't want to hear that they want, they want an, a, a simple clean assay that in 18 months gets you to a molecule that's going to get to get somewhere that you can actually do a safety and, and an efficacy trial and let's get it into patients on all that. that that's, that's where right then I mean, fair enough. That's that's where the emphasis is, and then, and then you have a few other funders like foundations who who want who are interested in really big questions of uh, of, of of life and and, and philosophy and, and science and things like that. And uh, yeah, it's 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 really hard to balance both. It's it's not easy in the in the setup that we have today. It's not easy. Hmm. I had a it sort of you know knocks me into a different uh, topic. I had a um, after our last interview, there was a comment in under the video that someone left, uh, which was critical. So they, they said that what you're doing is, uh, you know, they, they said, we're not machines. Um, it's anti-life. Oh my God. And yeah. so I, I, I wanted to, I, I didn't respond to them. I sort of just left the comment up, but I, I wanted to get sort of your idea on, you know, first of all, so there's a, there's a few different questions that sort of come out of here. So, so first of all is, you know, is the first point we're not machines, is, is there a difference between, is there a genuine difference between plants, animals, and machines? you know, is there something special about biological life? And, um, you know, are these categories sensible and, and why do we fight over them? Is there, is there a, um, you know, why, why are these sort of top, you, you, on the one hand, you're trying to help people who have cancer and you're trying to help people who have lost a limb and, and uh, maybe you can one day help uh, children who have had fetal alcohol poisoning. You know, there's, there's all these amazing applications that may come out where, where I can only see that, you know, there are positive outcomes here. You know, what, why do you think that people uh, get fired up in this direction? And do you think the categories are meaningful and useful at this point, or are they breaking down? Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll say a couple of things about that. Um, the first thing is that, uh, look, I, I, I would bet you any amount of money that, that whoever this is leaving that comment is a young, healthy individual. Okay, uh, I have never gotten an email like that from uh, from 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 people who are who are uh, sick. In fact, I get I get heartbreaking emails uh, basically every day. Uh, talking about the, the most the most unbelievable medical suffering that people are living under, right? So, so children with birth defects and adults with spinal cord breaks and and various deformities and 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 you know uh, somebody lost their limbs and and just I mean you name it, people are emailing me with the most unbelievable stuff. Uh, I, I I I couldn't even imagine a conversation between that that community and the occasional people that email me saying that what are you doing? This is you know this is too much. Uh, this you know you shouldn't. Right, the, the people who, who who write this are they they would not be putting these kind of ridiculous comments if they had a child who had a who had any kind of a disorder. The first thing they would do is hightail it to their local uh, hospital, where they would just pray that some somebody uh, had figured out what to do about it. Right, everything mm -hmm. changes once you know it's it's a it's a kind of a immature, it's an immature way of thinking, and until you realize how much suffering there is out there that needs to be addressed with these, that's 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 the first thing. Um, the second thing is that uh, you know this this issue of this issue of machines. Uh, one one thing that that people never do because because if they were to think about it this way, it, the, this, the, these issues evaporate immediately. Is try to give a proper account of what they mean by a machine, because and if you do sort of back somebody into a corner and say, Would you, "Why don't you explain to me what a machine is?" What they what they talk about is uh, and and biologists do this too. There are there are papers every every couple of months somebody publishes a paper saying living things are not machines. The the description of the machine that they're talking about are machines from the 1950s. Okay, these are the machines are not uh, the machines are not fundamentally what these people have in mind. And the concept of a machine has moved on, whereas our limited low imagination low technology version of what a machine is. Uh, has uh, has in many has, has cemented itself in many people's minds. So nowadays, uh, we we now understand that the class of machines includes things that are made not by humans, things that are made, for example, by other machines, 
things that are not predictable because they have uh, both both stochastic and noise driven and also history driven behavior. Uh, they have machines that change their own structure that make other machines. I mean, this is, you know, the, the, the machines are not what 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 we thought they were anymore. And in fact, some people, I mean, Turing knew what machines were. Lots of people knew what machines were long before. Um, long before now, but, but these, these folks have a, have a very outdated view of what, of what machines are. And in fact, if you ask molecular biologists, no molecular biologist wrestles with this issue because when you look down into the, into the uh, lowest level of, of cells, what you see are very advanced, very robust versions of machines we only wish we could build, right? And, and uh, with that, now, now the interesting question becomes, is there anything it, does life do anything that's unique that cannot, in principle, be engineered? Uh, I, I would think the answer is no. I don't. I've not seen any good. I mean, everything that I've ever heard from from people who say living things are not machines are either uh, descriptions of past machines that are just completely irrelevant, or things that are going to be obviously overcome by engineering. These are things that may not be doable now, but are certainly going to be doable in the future. So. Uh, I think where that leads us to is the question of what kind of machine are living things. And I do think that living things are a very special kind of machine. None of this is designed to uh, reduce the, the, the magnificence of life or, or, of, uh, or, or, or any of those kinds of things. That's what people are worried about. I think that's what people, why people are stuck on this stuff, is that, is that they think that by, quote unquote, reducing uh, life to machines, we're somehow going to uh, lose the majesty and the respect and, and various other things. I, I don't think there's any need for that at all. We, we didn't, what, what science has taught us is not that life are, isn't a machine. What science has taught us is that some machines are magnificent and, and there's a class of mach machines that are just wondrous and worthy of a moral consideration and all kinds of other interesting things. That's, that's, what, we're, that's what science has taught us, that machines are a very wide class and uh, of, of, of objects, and some of them are just amazing. And those that happen to, right now, they happen to be the living ones. Ultimately, there will be ones that are not living that do it as well. I, 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 will, I will also point out to one, one other thing that's kind of my favorite um, uh, reply. When, when people email me about, um, uh, with, with this stuff, oh, you know, well, that's too far, you know. I mean, that, that pacemaker I got, that's okay, but this, but this regenerative thing you're doing, no, that's too far. Uh, I basically, I send them a link to, there's a, there's a uh, there's a website that describes what happened the first time uh, the, the first time this guy went out onto the streets of London with an umbrella. Okay, that's what he had. He had an umbrella, the first umbrella. Well, there was a mob, right? There was a mob because people said, first of all, this is unnatural. And second of all, there's an inequity here. How come you're the only one that isn't going to get wet? And we're all getting soaked. And, and look, look at this guy with, with this umbrella. And, and they basically mobbed him. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's the human reaction to a lot of new... Um, uh, you know, to a lot of new inventions. And so I think we just have to be reasonable about things and, and acknowledge the massive uh, human suffering that needs to be dealt with. I, I didn't think uh, in this conversation you'd relate your your work to the development of the umbrella. I think there are... <laughs> you didn't but, see that um, coming? You didn't see that no. coming? <laughs> um, you know, it, it, I really like the idea that, um, you know, if you go back, you know, hundreds of years, thousands of years, we had this sort of idea that the earth was the center of the universe. Yeah. And as, as we developed, we, we sort of left the geocentric picture. And then we have this new view that we're just sort of a speck in this vast sea of different, um, you know, galaxies and stars, you know, that we're not, we don't have any special place in the universe. And sort of in a similar way, it, it seems like when it comes to life, we're sort of doing a similar sort of thing where we're leaving this uh, maybe biocentrism, uh, let's say. And, you know, when, medically, the, the moment of death is being pushed back and back and back with different technology, right? And, and with Josh Bongard, you have these xenobots, so robots made of living cells, and I guess there's artificial intelligences, and there's all these different directions that we're pushing out the boundary. How far do you think it's sensible to take this? You know, should the definition of life depend at all on the parameter space in which it exists? So, for example, um, to take sort of an extreme example, if I built a simulation and I had entities in the simulation that obeyed all the properties that you say life obeys, does that count? Is 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 that life, or or is that are we just being silly at that point? Uh, yeah. In in a serious way, I'm asking the question. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, so so so. There's a, there's a lot there. What you just said. There 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 are seven different ways to 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 go there. Um, uh, one thing is that I spend exactly zero time trying to understand the definition of life. I think that to me, and I and I know there are people who do it, and I'm glad they they work on this, and and that's fine. Um, I'm not very interested in figuring out uh, what the category of life entails. I'm, I'm very interested in uh, understanding cognition and what different different rungs on the ladder of cognition are all from from particles and rocks to all the way up through humans and whatever is whatever is past that. Uh, but but I don't think that life is a particularly interesting category in that respect because I think there are many things um, that are non-living that are going to be somewhere on that on that axis. I mean, life is good at uh, scaling up with cognition, and that's and that's cool. But I don't I don't focus on on life at all. Um, with respect to you know how how far we want to take it, I I, I want to say this. There are many people who, who worry about these things and they come, even, even if they don't verbalize it this way, what they're, what they're, they're really coming from this perspective. Um, everything's great right now. And I want to make sure that you scientists don't screw it up. Okay. You, you, you know, don't do anything that's quote unquote unnatural. That's going to make life worse and whatever. That was okay. Back in the day when people used to think that, well, the world was created uh, by a benevolent intelligence. And so therefore, of course, it's, it's, it's wonderful and let's not screw it up. Okay, we don't live in that world. We live in the world with massive challenges, incredible suffering, both human and, and non-human animal, uh, huge environmental challenges. Evolution, we, we got here by evolution. Evolution does not optimize for any of the things we value. Evolution does not care for, for your happiness. It doesn't care for IQ. It doesn't optimize any of those things. It optimizes for biomass. That's it. Just different ways of staying alive long enough to make the next one. Whether you're happy or not happy during that moment, nobody cares. And so, and so that tells us that there is no such thing. Like we have to grow up as a species. We have to grow up and get past this idea that we are somehow in a natural slash uh, ideal state. Uh, we, we are not. We are in a state identified by this meandering random process of evolution that sort of figured out that, that uh, this is one way to have a large biomass. And now as rational agents, we have a moral responsibility to do better than the product of a random search. Okay, that, that, is, that, is, that, is, you know, that, that is a critical thing for people to internalize that I think many people are not able to internalize, that, that we are not here because a benevolent force set things up nicely that we should sort of make sure it doesn't get screwed up. No, we got, we got, we, we, we got dumped into a situation that was the result of very complex search dynamics. And now that we know what we're doing, it is, or at least starting to, it is on us to improve things. And I, I, for one, find it impossible to believe that as rational agents, we can't do better than a, than a, than a hill climbing search. We, we have to be able to do better than that. And so uh, it's, it's on us to figure out how, how to do better. And that's, you know, that's, that's kind of, uh, that, that's, what guides, that's what guides me. I just, I just think we have to improve. We have to make life better than the way we found it. So which direction do you think we will go in along these lines? And I mean, so to be to, to flesh out the question, you know, usually as our technology advances, our ethics and morals change. So for example, um, with industrialization, automation, people argue that we got rid of slavery. Um, you could also argue that um, women's rights is tied to sanitation and the development of the pill, I guess. And maybe when we have, I don't know, um, artificial meat, maybe we'll get rid of factory farming and this sort of thing. Do, what do you think the moral shift will be that comes along with, you know, if, if we're able to engineer beings, engineer new humans, engineer, you know, what consciousness is and what life is, do you, do you have any picture of this? This might be too general. So if it's too general, I can, I can drill in deeper, but do, do you have a, an image of, of how our morals and ethics will shift, shift with these developments? Yeah, um, I, I, I have some things to say about that. Uh, you know, the, 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 one of the biggest technological changes, and again, I'm not a futurist, I don't know anything about what exactly is going to happen. These are just sort of my, my thoughts on it. Um, I, I, think, I think one of the, one of the biggest shifts that's, that's going to come at some point is the development of quote unquote free energy. So, so at, at some point when energy is no longer an issue, and when we have the ability, you know, with, with, if, if you have unlimited energy, you can make 
almost anything, right? It's, it's just an energy intensive, but you can make almost anything. At, the, at that point, th that will be a, a radical shift uh, in, 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 in human, uh, human society because, because that will basically do away with all the scarcity uh, dynamics. So all the things where we come now, now there will still be, there will, regardless of anything else, there will still be the rare individuals that are psychopaths or whatever, who um, their needs can only be met by inflicting whatever on, on, on other people. But the vast majority of issues we have has to do with scarcity of various types. And um, a lot of it, a lot of it, which would shift or go away if that just wasn't an issue anymore. Now, whether, whether we're going to survive as a species to that point, or we're going to, you know, meet uh, some sort of, um, uh, untimely demise before that, I have no idea. But I think I think that is going to trigger a massive change that that's just, you know, everything up until now, all of the things that you've talked about, all the limitations, you know, with the, everything was about uh, res limit, limited, limited resources and various struggles for those resources, right? I think that at some point that's going to go away. And what happens after that, I'm, I'm not sure. But, but the, the, other, the other shift in, in, uh, in, in, in ethics um, that I think is coming is that <clears throat> we are uh, and I think this, this has already started, and I think we're going to see a lot of it in our lifetime. Uh, we are going to be surrounded by beings, um, you can call them agents, most generally agents, that um, are nowhere on the tree of life as we know it. In other words, they will have none of the familiar touchstones that we use to recognize where morally something is, is something sits, right? So, so, so in the past, if you if if you encountered a new a new uh, system and you wanted to know what do you owe it morally, you could come over and you could tap on it. You could just sort of sort of tap on it, and if you heard a metallic clanging sound, you would you would make conclusions. You would say, ah, this came out of a factory. It uh, has it's it's a simple machine. It um, and and I'm morally um, uh, uh, fine with taking it apart and, and using it for spare parts and or seeing what uh, what makes it tick or whatever, right? Whereas if you do this and you get this sort of like soft like 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 um, you know, sound like, like, and you, and you feel it's kind of furry and warm, you say, ah, this is an evolved system. Uh, I need to be nice to it. Uh, uh, maybe I can eat it, but if it's only slightly different, I'm going to jail if I mess with it. So we're a little weird, you know, society is, is a little weird about those things. But, but in general, you realize that, uh, that in those, you would say that in those cases, okay, I, I need to be nice to, to this, to this thing. Now, that, Th those, um, those criteria, what is it made of and how did it get here, meaning evolved or designed, those are not going to survive the next decade or two because because that's out the window at this point with with biorobotics with with human cyborgs with um uh, hybrids and uh, and all kinds of uh, bio biotechnology. Never mind aliens. That's a whole other thing. If there is an exobiology to be studied, that that's a whole other thing. Although instructive, even though it's not real yet. Um, with all of these technologies, uh, any combination of evolved material, meaning DNA cells, tissues. Designed material, meaning meaning um, smart materials, um, uh, various engineered artifacts, and software. Any combination of those is some possible agent, and so we are going to be surrounded by these things. And uh, knowing how to relate to them is going to be impossible by just looking at what are they made of and, and how they got here. Now, so science fiction authors, of course, had this pegged a hundred years ago, where they you know they they put us in these situations where you know you're, you're sitting around. One day in the spaceship uh, lands on your front lawn and this thing sort of trundles out and it kind of hands you a, um, a poem about how happy it is to meet you and all that. And, and then what do you do? Because it kind of looks metallic, but you already knew that if it came from another planet, you wouldn't expect it to have a human style brain or human cells or maybe even carbon. You know, you, you wouldn't expect that anyway. And so, and so here it is. And so now what, what, are, your, what are your criteria for figuring out how to, how to relate to this thing. Are you, can you put it to work in your house? Can you take it apart? Can you, can you be friends with it? Could you marry it? Could you make, make it like, what can you do with it? Um, you know, what is your relationship? And I think that's really uh, important. We don't have a good handle on it. You see, you've seen recently all these um, uh, debates about uh, whether, whether modern AI is, is sentient or things like this. I mean, people don't define their terms properly anyway, but, but the key thing from all these debates is that Everybody has really strong feelings about it, but nobody states their criteria. So everybody says that's not it, it's you know it is or it isn't. But nobody says here 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 are the five criteria you have to meet in order to for me to uh, to 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 feel like I have to be kind to it. And because nobody knows what those criteria are, everybody you know at this point everybody says well uh, the Turing test is not enough just because these large language models 
write beautiful prose and answer questions and do all these things. That's not enough. Okay, well, that's not enough. What else? Anatomy doesn't do it because looking for the human brain is silly because we, you know that that can't be the only way to do to do intelligence in the whole universe. So, so that's not right. So, so what is it? Well, how are we going to decide these things? So, so that is going to be a, a massive shift once we once we start. In, you know, um, I, I think uh, I think the uh, again just just going back to sci-fi. I think that um, the popular kind of uh, vehicle that got this uh, the closest. Is something like that 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 iconic uh, cantina scene in the first Star Wars, where it's just like everywhere you look, there's some crazy kind of thing, and so half of them are on wheels, and you know, and and doing various things, and there's C-3PO, and there's uh, you know weird looking aliens. Like that, that's the world we're going to be living in. Every combination of of technology and biology is going to be around, and we are going to have to figure out how to relate to things that are not on this uh, tree of life. Remember, remember, the tree of life is an N of one here on this earth right? We've got literally one way that life has, has, has shaped itself. How much, you know, how, how, what, what do we tell our students? We tell our students that you can make, you can draw a lot of conclusions from an N of one, or that you can test your theories about biology from the same set that generated those theories. That's all we had. That's all we've had up till now, these natural, um, these natural um, uh, uh, beings. So, so we really, until, until the synthetic uh, sort of revolution comes up, we've been fooling ourselves in thinking that, uh, you know, and it was bad enough with Darwin, right? Darwin, Darwin gave us a single continuum. He said, he said, look, we are not different from the animals. There's a single continuum. And that was like, whoa, you know, ma massive societal upheaval. That'll be, that'll be child's play compared to what's actually coming. It's not a single dimension. It's a huge uh, multidimensional option space of beings that we are going to have to figure out how we're going to relate to them. That, that's, that's the major um, ethical upheaval that's, that's coming. I sort of worry that we're not... So we're not evolved at all to deal with this sort of the thing, mm -hmm. right? There's where we empathize with things that have faces that look, you know, human or that are furry, but there's no way that we're prepared to empathize with something that's completely alien to us. Uh, and so I sort of you worry know, that um, we're naturally going to be causing a lot of suffering going on down the line. I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I'll say, I, you're right. We, we are, we are definitely not evolved to recognize intelligence in other spaces. So for example, bacterial metabolic space, um, uh, morphogenetic space. Yeah, we're, we're not good at recognizing intelligence in these spaces. But, but, but one thing I want to, I want to push back on is that um, in my experience, while while adults who have all kinds of theories about what should and shouldn't be and, and, and are, um, you know, sort of uh, insulted by, by thinking that they might be machines and all this kind of stuff. Adults have issues with this. Children take, uh, take up, uh, and, and young, young students, in fact, uh, you know, young adults who are in robotics, who are in bioengineering, they don't have any problem with this. They, you know, kids, kids will, kids will uh, uh, take, up, take up a friendship with, a, with a, some kind of a robot, no problem. They don't, they don't have any of these preconceptions because, because fundamentally our, our cognitive system is, is primed to try to estimate agency in the outside world, right? Where we have to know if you're going to survive, you have to know the difference between a mouse and a, and a, and a, and a, and a rock in terms of what are they going to do later on. And uh, I, think, I think children will have zero problem with, with any of this. Uh, raised, raised in that environment, they're going to find our uh, questions and our battles over this completely quaint. And uh, someday, I, I think some, someday it will be it will be ridiculous. It will be, um, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm blanking on a good on a good analogy, but you know, when you when you think back to some of the things that that uh, that, that that people argued about in the past, you know, in the Middle Ages, and you're like, oh my God, that's that's you know, that's just ridiculous. That that's how that's how they're going to uh, that that's how future generations are going to think about us. Do you think? So the question I was going to ask is, you know, when when is turning off the machine murder, but following what you just said, it might be a completely different question. You know, there might be something that's, you know, I don't know, there might, might be something else that machines don't like us doing to them. Um, you know, that's equivalent to what we see. You know, the, the question, yeah, the yeah. questions that we're asking now might just be, as you say, child's play or, or, or um, uh, quaint, sorry. Um, do, do you have a, a picture though, uh, you know, if I was to ask that, you know, when when yeah. is switching off the machine murder? Like, what, where where is the that boundary? Yeah. Well, I I want to I want to remind us of a couple of things. First of all, um, murder is it is an extremely high bar. We don't we don't start with murder. We you know when you when you when you find your when you find your kid, um, uh, uh, you know, pu pu pulling the wings off of a fly. 
it's a problem and you talk to them about it, but it's not murder, right? And so we already know that 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 there's a collection of, you know, don't 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 pet the cat like that. He doesn't like it. Or oh, versus uh, you know, that that's already we, we already have those conversations long before uh long before murder. And so uh that's so that's 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 one thing we gotta we gotta get straight. Another thing is that uh you know People are people are really um, worried about um, creating these new intelligences. Oh my God! What happens if we create a um, you know a, a, a sentient being? Look, we, we create new, very high level intelligences all the time. It's called having children. We do it all the time. We do it. We do it constantly. We do it without, as as Dennett would say, competence without comprehension. We have no idea how we do it. We don't have a good theory of uh, that anybody agrees on and how to raise these children. Many of them don't get the care uh, that that you would think is are required to make a to make a, a, a being that's going to be a productive member of society. Uh, we do this all the time and without really a good understanding of it. And so so just think about it. Every every moment of, of every day, there are incredibly intelligent uh, beings being produced, let loose into the world with some sort of training. I mean, they talk about, oh, you know, you train the kid on the, you train an AI on the internet and it soaks up all kinds of crazy stuff. What do, you th- what do you think a lot of the kids worldwide are, are being trained on? Well, you know, they're being raised in these abominable environments that, and then, and then they, and then they're let loose into the world with human level intelligence and who knows what the, and, and you see some of them do incredible beneficial things. Some of them do horrible, uh, you know, so horrible things and war crimes and whatnot. Uh, th- that has already been with us forever. Right, the making making high level intelligences that you do not control, that you don't know how to train for positive uh, outcomes necessarily. That, that's been with us forever. So, so, so this is this is exactly the same. Uh, and any parent knows. I mean, I, I think I think parenting is um, a really uh, really valuable uh, uh, training for anything related to to AI and things like that because you know right away when your kid is little, you try to you try to encode some rules and you say, hey, uh, lying is bad. And then they immediately, you know, tell the truth in some some horrible, embarrassing context that makes somebody feel bad. And you say, nah, you should have lied. You say, well, what's the, you say, all right, well, look, and then, and then you sort of try to make a rule. Then you realize that the rule that you can't make a rule. And then you sort of just try to um, give them meta rules. And, and then you, 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 you calibrate them on some cases. And then you hope in the future that, that they figure out how to do things that make you proud. That's it. That's that. That's right. That's that. that, that that's we, we, we know that it's very hard to to control this, even uh, even in the most basic case. And so, uh, you know, what's the right way to do this? I don't know. I'm certainly not uh, going to claim that I've come up with uh, any solution to this or that I have the solution to an ethical system of the future. I don't. But I think but 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 I'll, I'll just sort of just for fun, I'll sort of take a stab at it. Uh, I think the 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 golden rule and it's sometime in the future. The golden rule is going to be something like be nice to goal seeking systems. It's going to be something like that. It's going to be figure out what degree of competency you're dealing with. And to that level of competency, be, be kind and, uh, and um, uh, you know, sort of show, show, show compassion to systems in proportion to their, to their level of, of goal directedness. That is some, some, something like that. But, but this is, you know, this is amateur hour, right? I mean, I'm, I'm hardly uh, in a position to be able to formulate something like that. But, but, but that's, that's where I think this is going. It's okay to bat above your pay grade. I, I, was, uh, I would say uh, one of the key things that, um, you know, if, if you're trying to come up with a rule, I suppose what you're really trying to do is help the child empathize with other people. That's sort of what you're saying, I suppose. And one of the things I find quite curious is, um, you know, when it comes to empathy, humans are really good at empathizing with one person or or a small group of people. Um, You know, we see on the news, some person was murdered or we see something horrible happen to people and we really feel it sort of viscerally. Um, But then at the same time, if you hear, that, you know, in some battle, 5,000 people were killed or a million people were killed. It's just a number. And we, we don't, we don't have this, there's no proportionality to the way we empathize with groups of yeah. people who are suffering. And, and so I guess the question I want to ask is, um, you know, if you wanted to define a super intelligence or, or, you know, if you wanted to define something that was like superhuman, let's say, uh, or, or, or human, does it have to do with its ability to uh, empathize with other humans? Is is that is that the key? 
Yeah, that's you know, I'm I'm glad you you asked that. That's somebody asked me that uh, on on another interview a few months ago, and I, I thought it was a very interesting question about what what is exactly a human, right? Because uh, I mean, okay, if you're in anatomy class, there's one answer, but I don't think that's an interesting answer. Is it is it the genome? No, I think that uh, you can you can change out the genome, and it doesn't really matter. Is it the anatomy? No, someday we'll be living underwater or on you know on on some other planet, and we'll all be look different. What's what's a human? To me, to me, a useful definition of human is a a level of uh, compassion. Exactly, it's a moral ter- it's a moral uh, capacity. It's a level of compassion, exactly as as what you just said. It's 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 where is your linear range for being uh, ex- exhibiting care for others, for for other sentient beings? And so so let's let's think about it this way. We know that um, uh, when you go to court, there's a notion of diminished capacity, right? There's there's some there's some some model of what level of things can a typical human care about. And if you don't have the wherewithal to exert that level of care, maybe you were, on, maybe you were, uh, had you know some kind of brain damage or, or whatever. But but you just you just don't have the wherewithal to to to, to exert that level of compassion. Then 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 we know that uh, you're not responsible in the same way that your standard issue human might be responsible. Just like there's a diminished capacity, there's also enhanced capacity. So someday there will be creatures. Who and they will be superhuman in an important sense, not because they can lift things or, or you know, be more resistant to germs, but they will be superhuman in an important sense. They will be kind of like what's described in some, for example, in the Buddhist literature, where you might have a, a being that is literally capable in the linear range of caring about millions of other beings, or maybe all of them, right? In the same way that you and I manage to exert care over the two or three or five people in our families, like, like literally like that. They will have this massive linear range where, where when, when something happens to, to a thousand people, that's here. And then when it happens to a million people, that's literally a thousand times more, more worse for them, which, which we cannot, we cannot muster that, right? We're not a, humans aren't able to muster that. So, so, so I think we have to be, we have to realize that there's this, um, uh, there's this uh, spectrum or, or continuum of, of moral concern. And uh, we are occupying some sort of narrow band on it. And, and we've seen many times how we fail and, and for various reasons, but we can also do better than what we're doing now. And someday there will be creatures that do way better. They just have the capacity, both, both the IQ and, and other aspects uh, of, of cognition where they can literally care about uh, many more things than, and, and beings than we can. So that's, that's, you know, we can only aspire to that. Um, but, uh, but that's, that's, we, we, you know, we need to be looking upwards and that's, that's what's, what's there. It makes me think, you know, clever people say that, um, you know, we, we, if, if there was a super intelligence, you know, you shouldn't worry that it's going to be evil. The real problem is that it might be ambivalent. You know, it'll think of us like maybe ants or something, but after what you said just then, I wonder if the real danger is that we create something that has some moral prerogative that we don't understand or can't possibly understand and that it does something that we don't mm-hmm. want it to do because we're not you know at that moral level let's say yeah uh, it's a real problem but but let's not pretend uh, this is a new problem uh, pick a pick a pick a horrible tyrant throughout history right that's done terrible things and significant things, you know, somebody really impactful, and ask yourself whether their parents have this in mind when they when they gave birth. Or probably not, right? Maybe maybe sometimes, but but generally probably not. So so we already have have lots of experience with in his, throughout history of creating a very high level intelligence that's really good at just wrecking things off horribly, right? We're we're very we're, we we've already had examples of this. So 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 yes, I think it's a it's a definitely a problem. I think that. Um, there's no guarantee that an advanced intelligence by itself, I don't, I don't think intelligence by itself is a guarantee of benevolence. It's not a guarantee of empathy by itself. Although I think there is a relationship there. Um, I think it's very hard to, to, to become a really good intelligence without being able to take on others' perspective. But, 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 but as with humans, there are failure modes that lead to sociopaths and things like that. So, so for, for sure, I think it's possible to create high IQ uh, um, uh, beings that, uh, that are just terrible to have around, but that, that problem has always been with us. I, I don't know what the answer is. I j- I'm just pointing out that this is not the first time we're running into this. This has always been the case. Maybe a better example is, I guess the internet in some ways, like a super intelligence, right. And you have outrage mobs that do all sorts of crazy stuff that, <laughs> so maybe that's a better example. I, I, I'm wondering, um, 
you know, I asked this question to my last guest as well. Um, it might be appropriate here. Um, you know, we're used to, it's sort of normalized that um, we have children and some, someday you'll die and your children will, will take over. And, and I mean, it's sad that you'll die, but it, this is sort of normal. We, we don't grieve the fact that there's going to be a new generation that just takes the world in a completely different direction. Do you think, let's say, for example, we did create life 2.0 or whatever it is, or whatever you want to call it. We expand the, you know, we no longer have this one dimensional thing. We've got a two dimensional space or whatever the dimensions of the space are. Do you think we should view, you know, if, if there are no longer humans a thousand years from now, but there's whatever follows us, us should we think of that? Should we, we be sad about that? Or is that just the next, should we view it the same way that we view our children taking over? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, I guess, I guess the first thing I would say is, uh, much like with the, telling people to calm down, it, you know, that's never worked ever, right? And I think telling people what they should and shouldn't be sad about um, probably doesn't doesn't work either. So, so I think people will be sad about whatever they're going to be sad about. I'm not sure there's any any way to, to, to change that. But uh, for myself, I mean, I, get, I, I think I think what you, what you have to do is you have to sort of um, divide up the, the, the categories and ask yourself, okay, let's see. If uh, the people of the future have different DNA, do I care? Well, some people are super into DNA. These are the people that are all about like 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 a paternity and you know and and do they, they, you know does this person have exactly my DNA and and based on that I'm going to decide how I'm going to treat them. Uh, I mean I, I find that hard to fathom, but okay. So some people are super into DNA, um, but most people not. You say I don't care what DNA they have. That's not really. And then and then you say, well, uh, will you care? Will, will, you know, will you be sad if they are you know much more resistant to disease and some of them have gills and and they can do all kinds of cool stuff that you can do? No, I'm not really sad about that. I, I want my kids to be able to do things I never could do, right? So that's okay. Uh, and then you might say, all right, well, what if what if they're um, what if they're super intelligent? Yeah, great. I always wanted my kids to be smart. And you say, well, what if what if they're so intelligent that they think everything you've ever done is stupid? And I'm going to say, okay, that doesn't exactly make me happy, but I'm probably not going to be sad about it because yeah, that's progress, right? That's 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 just how it is. We, you know, we, we hope the next generation does better. So you sort of run down each of these things and you ask, well, what exactly, you know, if they don't look like us at all, is that, I don't, re I'm not really tied to this particular primate, you know, sort of form is that, you know, what will, and, and so what does make you sad? So, so probably uh, if they were to lose, if they, if they were to lose uh, uh, the, the compassion aspects of what it means to be human, that that would make me sad, just you know personally. But I think everybody can sort of the well, the best you can do is is divide it up and figure out which of these things do you really feel sad about, right? Well, what what is really the thing that you hope continues? I mean, I don't really care. You know, we're a particular kind of um, you know primate. Uh, do I care that that's what goes on? No. But 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 I would like them, you know, I, what, whoever follows this, I would like them to to have the at, at minimum the same, hopefully more level of compassion, and I would like them to be doing interesting things in 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 understanding their world better. They, once they've checked those two boxes, I, I, I lose the ability to be sad for it. Hmm. Yeah, these sort of questions really mess with your sense of self, actually. If you follow, yeah. <laughs> because I mean. As you said at the beginning, evolution doesn't care about intelligence or your happiness or anything like this. So it could be that, you know, I, I give you a time machine, you go, you know, millions of years in the future and your direct descendant is like a fish or something. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah totally. totally. And, and then the question is, would you eat that fish if you were hungry? But um, <laughs> I, I'm, I, I realize uh, you have to go pretty soon. So I'm, I'm going to wrap up um, with two very sort of light questions. Um, and there's a third one if you, if, if we've got time, but, um, so I'm just curious, just in terms of getting a grasp on more of your personality, really, it's not, it's not really anything you need to uh, stress about in terms of the science side. So one of the things I like about what you're doing is, is it's sort of like, um, you, you know, you're, 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 looking sort of like behind the magician's trick somehow like you're sort of uncovering why it is that uh evolution works right you need these agential materials which trying which to you're, anyway yeah you're trying to is it well yeah. so you're, you're looking at uh why it is that evolution is not so fragile you know if, if we didn't 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 have agential materials maybe evolution wouldn't work at all um and and you're, you're so the, the question that i'm curious about is for you when you uncover the way the magician does it, so to speak, do you, does it become 
less exciting for you? Or, or you know, where does the joy, uh, do you have the same level of joy um, once you've discovered something? Does it become more vibrant to you? Uh, I'm, I'm just curious about, uh, yeah. just, just, yeah. Uh, well, two things. First, just, uh, just in terms of uh, practicalities, I have never come across a case, both in my own work and other people's, you know, when I read science books about the, the things other people have done, uh, I have I've never come across a case where after you see how something works, it, it seems less wondrous than before. It's always more amazing. It's always more amazing, right? You see, you see, you see something, you go, wow, that's amazing that it happens. And by the time you learn all the things that are, that, that are here in our universe that makes that work, you're, you're, you're 10 times more amazed. You're like, oh my God, now, now here, here are now 20 other things that need explaining because, because it's just incredible that, that, this, that this works in certain ways. So I've never, I've never found anything that, where the answer is, oh, well, now that I see, now I realize that some people have had this experience. I've had this, I've had this said to me. Um, I gave a talk once uh, at, a, at, a, at a top institution where somebody said to me afterwards, um, well, uh, I, I really like the first part of your talk about bioelectricity, and it, and it seemed amazing. But then in the second half of the talk, you showed how it works. You showed the mechanism. And now, and now I don't care anymore. And I, you know, that, 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 because now that I see where, how it's done, it's just more chemistry and physics. And I said, well, what did you think was going to be underneath? You didn't think it was going to be chemistry and physics underneath? Like what, what else would it possibly be? I, I th that, that view is on a different planet than I am as far as I'm concerned. But, but, but to me, uh, I, once you understand all the things that come together to make something possible, that's I, I've never seen that be less less wondrous. I just my I'm I'm just I'm I'm unbelievably awed every time I come into the lab. I see I see things and people you know my, my my folks here show me things on a weekly basis that blow my mind in a way that makes me much happier than I was before I knew how how it worked. So so no, I think I think the wonder just just goes up as as you go along. Hmm. With my own research, I never actually get to the end of the question. You know, I mm. whenever I work yeah. something out, there's always, as you say, ten more questions. Yeah, but, and so, but you know, and, and by the way, that's that's not a universally um, a, a kind of a desired trait either. I've had I had a paper once where uh, the negative comment, one of the reviewers hated it, and, and the comment was, "Well, this paper it, this paper brings up ten new questions than than it answered." And I, 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 you know, you have to laugh and cry at the same time because I mean, yes, fair, but. I kind of thought that's what we were doing here. Did was it rejected? Or? <laughs> uh, it, if it eventually, it eventually made it. But but that person was very clear that he he or she wasn't looking for for new questions. They wanted one one thing neatly sort of wrapped up, and hopefully that would be the end of that. And you know, and then so on. Again, I don't I don't get that view, but but some people have that. So then, what makes you excited about the future? So, so when you when you look at your research and where it's going, and and you know what the dream is moving forward, what what gets you excited? Uh, but two, two two basic things. I mean, I I believe I I hope and believe that we are going to make an impact on patient health. This is this is just something that uh, I've wanted. You know, I I've wanted to do since uh, since I was very young. This this idea that there are people around who are not able to reach their full potential that are living with suffering of all kinds. And just because of ignorance, because of our ignorance, because we don't know how to fix stuff. And when you look, when you look back and you're like, oh my God, it, through, throughout history, how many people had to go through horrible things. And if they just had some penicillin, or if they just knew that to wash their dang hands or whatever, whatever it was, these things seem so stupid. Now it's so much needless you know, or, 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 you know, splinting bone, you know, bone breaks and things like that. It's just ridiculous how much um, suffering there was because of ignorance, because we just had no clue what we were doing. And so I, f I feel like that's where we're at now, uh, of course. And uh, the thing that makes me incredibly excited is a vision and, and who knows if, if I'll be able to contribute to it or not, but, but someday I, I firmly believe we will be able to fix pretty much any medical issue because of this. Once we understand how it is, how, what, what communicating with cells and tissues really entails, not, not trying to micromanage them with, with symptom relief, but, but literally communicating to, to reset the health state um, and take advantage of the intelligence of the, of the, of the uh, collective of cells, uh, we would be able to fix almost anything. And that, that is just, and, and, then, and then you can really be a proper human when you're not spending your day figuring out what do I do because I can't do this and that because I feel old or something hurts or whatever, that, those are all distractions. You know, we, we should all have a, 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 a health span that enables us to reach our full creative potential. And, and I'm very excited about that. The other thing is I'm also, 
And so, so that's kind of on a practical level. Uh, the other thing is I'm, I'm really excited about uh, growing up as a species. So, so we, can, we can really dump these um, old categories that were uh, kind of consequences of limitations of imagination of technology, things like evolved versus design, machine versus organism, you know, intelligent versus just physics, stuff like that. We are close to being able to dump all that stuff. And that's just, it's painful. It's going to be painful. Like, like, you know, like finding out there's no Santa, you have to sort of re, re, um, you know, readjust your, uh, your view of, of, of how things work and that, wow, someday I'm going to have to buy somebody presents. Whoa. Like, like, right. It's like, it readjusts your, your, your worldview a little bit, but that's okay. Uh, and, and we'll be in a better place for it when we really understand how much sentience there is uh, around, around us. I think I, we just have to grow up and, and, um, and do that. I'm, 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 you know, I'm excited about that in the future. Well, Michael Levin, it's been a pleasure having you back on the podcast. Thanks for coming Thank on. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for the conversation. It's been fun.